Hello, welcome to Prajim Technologies. I am Venkat. This is part 55 of SQL Server. In this session, we'll learn about handling errors in SQL Server 2005 and later versions. Before continuing with the session, I strongly recommend to watch part 18 and 55 of this video series. With the introduction of try-catch blocks in SQL Server 2005, error handling in SQL Server is now very much similar to programming languages like C Sharp and Java. In SQL Server 2000, to handle errors, we use at at error system function. In fact, we have seen in part 55 of this video series how to handle errors using at at error system function. If you haven't watched that part, I would strongly encourage you to do so before continuing with the session. In SQL Server 2005 and later, we can make use of this try-catch construct to handle errors. In fact, handling errors with try-catch construct is much easier than handling errors with at at error system function. Today, for this demo, we'll be making use of TBL product and TBL product sales tables, the same tables that we have worked with in part 55 of this video series. TBL product table is like an inventory table which contains the names of the products, and their respective unit prices and the quantity available in stock. Product ID is the primary key for this table. And TBL product sales table contains information about the products that we sold. So if you look at the columns, product sales ID is the primary key, product ID is the ID of the product that we have sold, and quantity sold is obviously the quantity that we sold. So whenever we sell a product, you know, there are th two things that should happen. First, we should deduct the quantity that we are selling from TBL product table. Next, we should record the transaction in TBL product sales table. Let's understand this with an example. Now, at the moment, there are 50 desktops available. Now, let us say I want to sell five desktops. So the first thing we have to do is we have to deduct from 50 the five desktops. So we should update the quantity available column in TBL product table. Next we need to insert a new row into TBL product sales table. The product ID that we are selling is number two because that's a desktop. So number two and the quantity sold is five. So in brief, whenever we make a transaction, whenever we sell a product, you know, it should first update TBL product table and insert a new row into TBL product sales table. Now let's look at a stored procedure which is capable of doing that. Now this is essentially the same stored procedure that we have worked with in part 55 of this video series. So we have a procedure called SP sell product which takes two parameters, product ID and quantity to sell, both of them of type integer. The first thing the stored procedure should do is to check the stock available for the product that we want to sell. Now let's say here we have the stock available variable of type integer. Into this variable, we are loading the quantity that's available for the product that we want to sell. Select at stock available is equal to quantity available from TBL product, where product, is e product ID is equal to whatever is the product ID that we are passing in into this stored procedure. Now, the next important thing is to check, okay, if the stock available is less than the quantity that we want to sell, then we are in a problem we cannot continue with that transaction. So we have to throw an error back to the calling application stating that there is no enough stock available. And that's what we are doing. And the way we are doing it is by using raise error function. So this raise error function basically takes three parameters. The first parameter is the error message. The second parameter is error severity. In most cases, when we want to create and return custom errors, we use a severity level of 16, which indicates that these are general error errors that can be corrected by the end user. And the final parameter is the error state, which is a number between 1 and 25. Raise error only generate errors with state from 1 through 1 to 7. In our example, for the error state, we are using a value of 1. Okay, on the other hand, if there is enough stock available, we come into the else block, and within the else block, the first thing that we want to do is to update the TBL product table, you know, the quantity available column. So, update TBL product set quantity available is equal to whatever is the quantity available from that subtract the quantity that we are selling. 
and this is nothing but the parameter that we are passing in whatever is the quantity that we want to sell where product ID is equal to at product ID so obviously you will have to reduce that quantity for the product that we are selling how do we know which is the product that we are selling we are passing in the product ID into the store procedure and that's what we are using here in the where clause and the next important thing to come so we have done half of the work we have updated this TBL product table. The next thing is to insert a row into this TBL product sales table. And obviously, to insert a row into this table, we need values for three columns, product ID, quantity sold, and product sales ID. Product ID and quantity sold are coming into the procedure as parameters, so there is no problem in retrieving those values. But product sales ID is the primary key column, and it is not an identity column, so we will have to supply a value for that manually. And to do that, first we have to figure out what is the maximum value that is present. Because if you try to insert another two into this table, you will get an error. You will get a primary key violation error. So we first need to calculate the max of the product sales ID. And then to that, we need to add one. And that's what we are doing here. If you look at the code that we have here, it's slightly complex than what we have just discussed. We are saying, OK, select at max of product sales ID. Now the reason why we are using case statement is here is because of a situation where if there are no rows at all in TBL product sales table, if this table is empty, max of product sales ID will return null. So when max of product sales ID is returning null, when max of product sales ID is null, then we want to return zero instead of null because for a null, if you add one, it will still be null. That's why when max of product ID, product sales ID is null, then return zero, else return max of product sales ID. And then to that, add one. That way we are computing the value for the primary key column. And then finally, insert those values into TBL product sales table. Insert into TBL product sales values, the values for the three columns. That's it. So let's create this procedure now. And if you look at one more thing, all these statements, updating TBL product table, inserting into TBL product sales table, both of these statements are wrapped inside begin transaction, commit transaction statements, which means our intention is to basically treat them as a single unit of work. Either both of them should succeed, or even if one of them fails, then we want to fail the other one and roll back the transaction. That's our intention. But then here, this may not work as expected. But first, let's see it in working action. Now, if you look at the data that we have in TBL product table, there are 50 desktops and 70 laptops available. And let's say we want to sell you know, 10 desktops. And to do that, to this stored procedure, SP sell product, we need to pass in values for the two parameters, product ID. The product ID is 2. And the quantity that I want to sell is 10. So let's execute this store procedure and see what's going to happen. So one row affected. Now let us see. So as expected, desktops quantity available is 40. And there is a row inserted into TBL product sales. Now let's try to manually insert an error into this store procedure. And the way we can do it is simply comment this line. So the place where we are actually incrementing the primary key value by 1, we are commenting that line. So obviously, what's going to happen now, we will get a primary key violation. So let's try to sell 10 more desktops and see what happens. So before we do that, let's look at, OK, there are 40 desktops available. So I can happily sell 10 desktops. So let's see what happens when we press F5. Oh, we haven't altered the stored procedure. That's why it sold those 10. Now, we only changed it here, but we haven't really altered the procedure. So let's alter the procedure. So alter plus F5. OK, so there are 30 desktops available. Now let's sell 10 more and see what's going to happen. Now we should get that primary key violation. Look at this. It says one row affected, which means from the 30 desktops that are available, it deducted 10, but it should, but it didn't insert a row into TBL product sales table. So, which is like inconsistent. 
So to, to detect the errors and then to roll back the transaction, in the previous session we have seen how to use at at error system function. In this session, we will see how to do the same thing using try catch block, which is much easier compared with using at at error. So if you look at this, it's exactly the same procedure. All we are doing here is you know the update TBL product statement and calculating of the primary key value and inserting into TBL product sales. All this code is now wrapped inside a begin try and end try block. So when these statements are being executed, if at all if there is any error situation, what's going to happen, the control will immediately jump to the catch block. And then if you look at in the catch block, what we are saying in the first, the first statement is to roll back the transaction. So we are rolling the transaction back. So which means even if this statement has executed successfully, that will also be rolled back. Okay. And then there are, there is some functions here, which we will talk about in a bit. And on the other hand, let's say there are no errors. Everything is working fine as expected. Let's say there are no errors. Then what's going to happen? We are finally committing the transaction, which means the changes will be made permanent in the database. So it's so easy to use the try catch blocks to detect and handle errors. Okay, so let's alter this procedure. Command completed successfully. So we have successfully altered the stored procedure. And another thing to keep in mind is these functions. Now look at this. If there is an exception within the statements here that you can say that are wrapped inside begin try and end try. If at all there is an exception here, what happens? The control immediately jumps back to the catch block. The first statement in the catch block, you know, gets executed and the rest of them. So whenever there is an error condition, we want to find out what is the error number, error message, the procedure where the error has occurred, the state of the error, the severity number and the line number. And to do that, we have several built-in SQL Server functions which gives information about those errors. And the names are very meaningful. Error number returns the number of the error. Error message returns the message of the error and so forth and so on. Okay, now remember these functions will have that error information only within the context of the catch block. If you try to execute them, Outside the context of the catch block, they return null. Now let's say, let's select them, let's execute them in isolation. I'm just selecting them and executing. Look at this. When I execute them, everything is null. Okay, so only when there is an error and when this statement is being executed within the context of that catch block will we get the error information from those functions. Okay, so these are those functions. And this is the basic syntax for the try catch blocks. You know, any set of SQL statements that you that are wrapped between begin try and end try, you know, whenever those statements are executed, if at all if there is any any exception, the control will immediately go to the catch block. On the other hand, if there is no exception, the control will go to the statement after the catch block. And remember, errors that are trapped by catch blocks are not returned to the calling application. So if any part of the error information must be returned to the application, the code in the catch block must do so by using raise error function. In the scope of the catch block, there are several system functions. These are the functions that are used to retrieve more information about the error that has occurred. These functions return null if they are executed outside the scope of the catch block, and we have seen that. And try catch block cannot be used in a user defined function. All right, so now let's quickly execute the stored procedure and see what's going to happen. So let's see what's there at the moment. So we at the moment we have 70 laptops. So let's go ahead and sell 10 laptops. So I'm selling 10 laptops. So at the moment everything should work fine because if you look at the stored procedure, you know. We haven't commented this line, which would generate that primary key violation error. So it should work. So let's copy that. Let's execute the store procedure. So one row affected. 
and you should say so quantity available is 60 and there are 10 laptops sold so which is what we expected now let's go ahead and comment this lines so that we get a primary key violation error let's alter this procedure before executing that now let's try to sell desktops let's see how many desktops we have in the inventory we have 20 laptop uh, 20 desktops let's try to sell five of them so I want to sell five desktops and now we are expecting a primary key violation to occur and then the transaction should be rolled back so execute look at this now the primary key violation has occurred but then since we trapped that inside a catch block you know we don't have that error information shown in the output and then we are rolled back the transaction and if you look at the output you know in the catch block we are saying select the error number error message look at this it clearly says what is the error message violation of primary key constraint and then which is the procedure that caused the error SP cell product is the name of the procedure and then error state error severity and then error line number at which line in the procedure did the error occur line number 34 so to find out which line is that press control G and then type in the line number and click OK it will take you to the line number and your cursor will be blinking there okay so if it's if this is not clear and this is the line which caused that if this is not clear another way to show the line numbers is go to tools options and in text editor select transact SQL general and select line numbers click OK it should show the line number so if you look at the line number it is saying error line is 34 for some reason it's showing the line number as this one in fact it should be this one let's execute this once again and see what's gonna happen okay let's oh, okay maybe we have these that's why we have these on the top that's why the line numbers are not correct so let's press 34 now it should go to that insert statement okay on this slide you can find resources for ASP.NET C Sharp and SQL Server interview questions. That's it for today. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.